Welcome to the intersection of technology, cybersecurity, and society. Welcome to ITSP Magazine. You're listening to a new episode of Stories from Space Podcast, where your host, Matthew Williams, examines the history of human spaceflight, the breakthroughs that revolutionized our understanding of the universe and our place in it, and the brave individuals who work tirelessly to advance the frontiers of our understanding. Knowledge is power, now more than ever. The authors acknowledge that this podcast was recorded on the traditional unceded lands of the Lekwungen peoples. Welcome back to another episode of Stories from Space. I'm your host, Matt Williams. With me in the booth today are Nathan Johnson and Chris Hersey of the Spaceport Foundation. Gentlemen, welcome to the show. Pleasure to be here. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Thank you for coming. So, to give uh, our uh, our listeners a, a quick uh, intro on uh, who you gentlemen are and what you do. So, the Spaceport Foundation, which you, the two of you established, is dedicated to space law, the cataloging, collection of it, and also, of course, the, the creation of it. Because as we enter into the renewed year of space exploration, there are volumes of legal uh, matters that need to be addressed in advance uh, to prevent total chaos. <laughs> would that be fair to say? Yeah, in, in general, I would say that the making of the space law, not so much the foundation, but uh, I think in some sense in our capacities in our professional lives, Nathan and I um, have been part of policy making and, and regulation making. So uh, that's partly true. But the Space Corps Foundation, is, as you articulated, is dedicated to space law, promotion of space law, education of space law, but also in particular, uh, the rule of law. because That's very important, especially as those who are trained as lawyers, we have duties to follow and uh, we can't really respect the law if we're not at least trying to uh, uphold the law, enforce the law and seek enforcement of the law. So mm -hmm. when it comes to what we're doing, Space Foundation on the educational side, we're still running our internship program. We currently have over 20 interns globally. We're going to cap that at 30, and we expect to have uh, a few slots available at the end of the summer uh, for those interested uh, in joining the internship program. And as part of the internship program, we have uh, several initiatives that the interns are working on, one of which uh, we're here today to discuss further, which is the Haley Project, the Andrew G. Haley Project, uh, as well as uh, what we're doing for Manfred Locks, uh, which Nathan will speak to, and some of our other uh, research initiatives, which uh, interns can participate, which is the collection and eventual cataloging of uh, national space laws uh, for further research. And we will announce some of those research initiatives uh, next spring. And uh, Nathan, I don't know if there's anything else you'd like to add. No, you know, we're, we're just hoping to continue on the work that we've done over the past two years. We sort of launched at the very beginning of the, the pandemic, we've established, you know, a really strong audience, especially with our YouTube channel. And we're hoping to uh, grow that audience there uh, and on social media and, and sort of continue, um, you know, our work as a, a digitally native uh, organization. Well, that's excellent. Um, now, a quick question for the both of you. Neither of you are strangers to space or to the law. And in effect, that's how you guys came to uh, create the Space Court Foundation, isn't it? So starting with you, Chris, what can you tell us about your uh, aerospace and legal background? So uh, my aerospace and legal background is pretty uh, multidisciplinary. Uh, I originally had an uh, undergraduate degree, uh, started out my education, graduating with a uh, bachelor's in mathematical physics and economics, um, and eventually found my way to space history. And from there, I found space policy and law. And I was, uh, I guess, for a time, a, a perpetual intern in DC, which is uh, pretty pretty average. Um, but uh, I was able to um, uh, work, uh, either get graduate fellowships or work as an intern or um, a low-level um uh, staffer uh, and uh, first starting out in the National Air and Space Museum as in the Space History Division, working with David Dvorkin, 
Uh, I worked uh, for Ken Hodgkins as a special assistant at the State Department um, and, a, and a few others. And um, I was I was very fortunate to get into the University of Mississippi Law School. Uh, and I uh, graduated with honors in space uh, and air law certificate that the program had offered and still offers, I believe. And um, uh, I was able to leverage my past experiences, especially going to conferences as a graduate student, to AIAA conferences and others. Uh, and eventually I got a job, uh, very fortunately, at Bigelow Aerospace, and that sort of started my professional career. Uh, and uh, started as corporate counsel, eventually director of the DC office for the company. And then today I run a, a, a boutique, I would say, consulting business, corporate management consulting business. But I have several space clients um, that uh, are uh, seeking to send people and things to space. And that seems to be where I've settled in my career, helping companies develop and grow uh, both in the space industry and other tech areas. So I've really been able to um, leverage a lot of my experiences uh, and use them and utilize my experience with the Space Corps Foundation, especially through a research program. And uh, it's been really great to have uh, a really great core of officers, including Julia Millett, who's our internship coordinator. Um, uh, and Nathan and I have been uh, very uh, fortunate to uh, have a great partnership uh, and <laughs> Uh, while it doesn't always feel some days that we're very productive, we do seem to get a lot done and, uh, and we're doing a lot and, you know, we really feel uh, what we're trying to achieve will help uh, at least the general public understand what is space law, because that is our primary research question. Mm -hmm. Now, Nathan, your turn. The last time that, that we had a discussion like this, I interviewed you, both of you gentlemen, for uh, uh, an article for Universe Today. Now, Nathan... Is this current here? Are you uh, part of the House Committee on Science, Space, and Technology? No, that was one of my internships in mm -hmm. law school. Um, you know, my journey to space law begins in Hollywood. Um, I have an undergraduate degree in radio, television, and film. So no hard sciences, no political sciences, uh, no pre-law background. But I recalled... Uh, in 2010, a speech that President Obama gave at the Kennedy Space Center, talking about his administration's um, continuation of the existing commercial cargo program, um, and that they would be using that model for the commercial crew program. And this was around the time that you know SpaceX uh, was successfully launching rockets; their rockets stopped exploding. You know. Mm -hmm. And it was a very exciting time to think about a growing private space sector. Um, and, you know, I think many people will, will view this cynically, but one of my thoughts was, well, I don't have a science background, but I bet all of these new private companies are going to need lawyers. Um, I, I was probably... Uh, predisposed uh, to going to law school. It may have happened regardless, but um, I did become very interested in the way that the government regulation and government procurement was involved with growing the space sector. And um, that got me interested in, in space law. And so you know, I went to, to law school in Washington, D.C. Um, I got to do internships with the FAA Office of Commercial Space Transportation at the time that SpaceX was doing its first uh, birth with a space station. Um, I interned with the House Science Committee as they were, you know, reviewing authorizations and liability issues for commercial human space flight. And it was just a very exciting time at the beginning of the 2010s because you know there were there were things happening and there were things on the horizon and you know in 2020 it, it was a very full circle moment for me when we saw SpaceX successfully launch astronauts to the International Space Station it, it was the full circle moment of me from hearing about the commercial crew program to seeing the first flight of the commercial crew program in a span of 10 years and to have been part of that industry during those 10 years, to, to be starting my career during those 10 years, um, it was just very exciting for me to see. And people might be somewhat cynical about 
lawyers getting involved. But I think about a quote from uh, Brian Israel, uh, who was uh, an attorney advisor at the U.S. State Department and is now an attorney at NASA. He gave a speech at the Manfred Locke Space Law Moot Court competition hosted by the ISL in the North American region, organized by me. His, his quote was, lawyers shouldn't judge their success by how many laws they create. Um, they should judge their success by their capacity to advise. And to me, that that is the goal. It's not to create more laws and red tape and legal hurdles. It's to be able to advise companies and advise the public and society on, on how to have peaceful space exploration. Because that that is the goal that that you know leads us back to the Space Court Foundation which is why rule of law is written into, you know, our mission statement. It's not just about educating people about space law and policy, but it's also the fact that, you know, the goal is stable civilization based on the rule of law so that we can achieve all of these dreams in outer space. Well, I, I certainly understand what you mean by there are those who would be cynical, but yeah. To them, I would say, yeah, this is this is not a question of, you know, do you uh, agree or not? It is this is going to happen or th- this needs to happen. Right. If uh, if there is no legal established legal framework for commercial entities and, and civilians going to space, uh, then we we will have a very serious problem. Now, this all I want to ask you about the current status of space, legally speaking. Um, There are many, many treaties in place, uh, foremost of which is the Outer Space Treaty, but that leaves so much unaccounted for right now. And uh, I I would say say this, and I'd ask if you agree, that uh, this has become, the issue of the law has become uh, much more controversial and action needs to be taken because of the recent decisions regarding commercial entities and what they can claim in outer space and what they can do out there. Yeah, it it feels like there is a bit of a struggle between commercial rights and the the spirit of the Outer Space Treaty, which basically said space is for all, space is free, you can't claim it. Would you say that's something you agree with? So, yeah, I think think the the way that I would probably frame this a little bit better uh, just to, to give your listeners a little bit of perspective, you know, every every country we think within boundaries, right? They have borders. So they have a territory, they have defined territory, and that defined territory is mapped onto a legal jurisdiction. And right now, the, the current way that we regulate commercial and civil and to some degree military space activities is via jurisdiction. And the United States are very familiar with the FAA, NOAA, FCC licensing different aspects of space activities, different segments of it. And with that comes a a flag. And with that flag comes the jurisdiction of the United States. Uh, So anytime a country launches something under their flag or within their territory, they're asserting that right through Article 6 of the Outer Space Treaty. So in general, when you, know, you look at the Outer Space Treaty, you look at uh, treaties in general, you want to look at the, all the articles together and you want to look at them in context. There are limits, yes, but both the prescriptive limits and the non-prescriptive limits, those limits that have been more or less decided in a normative fashion, maybe by some regulation. But when you look at the intersection of these things, it all flows through Article 6 of the Outer Space Treaty. So when you think about access. Yes, you have access to go there, but you also don't have the right to interfere. You also don't have the right to do things that could be harmful to, let's say, operations within wherever vicinity you might be operating or just to the space environment in general. That another example that have, that is sort of been incorporated into this sort of line of thinking is all the nuclear test ban treaties especially the ones for detonating nuclear weapons in outer space. And so there is a school of thought where you kind of look at the outer space treaty, look at it in context of the time, and as a historical vehicle, you also look at it as an arms control sort of thing. Because one of the concerns was whoever gets to the moon first 
might have the high ground. That was a huge concern. And the way that we mitigated that, in fact, Article 6 is, an, is a mitigation strategy that the United States used in the, in the treaty negotiations because the Soviet Union did not want commercial entities to be able to operate at all. And so Article 6 was the compromise that you needed uh, countries, uh, signatories, ratifying countries of, of the Outer Space Treaty have to be internationally responsible for their commercial activities. And the way that they assert that responsibility is supposed to be through these licensing regimes, which are set by the jurisdiction of the state. And there is some nuance in the way that the, uh, the jurisdiction might be applied, especially since you have a proliferation of commercial entities that are servicing different segments of the space industry internationally now, from ground stations to even launch. So that is where I think a lot of interesting things are happening, especially when you look at, uh, at least to date, how the United States has been able to um, convince states to enter into the Artemis Accords. And it has been moderately successful, especially in terms of any sort of international bilateral agreement in decades. It, it lays out principles that many of the, the countries that already have commercial entities operating and have a heritage of civil cooperation, I think, you know, creates a really new environment. And I'm even hearing among my colleagues new ways of, of thinking about what kind of rules we need for different types of operations. So to your point, not to necessarily bias the commercial against the civil, but there is going to be a balance that needs to happen. And the ISS so far has been a pretty good framework of that, but it'll be interesting to see where people go. And to that extent, you know, Space Court Foundation uh, is going to track these trends and it'll be eventually a part of our research program, which leads into how law actually is created, the evolution of law, which I think is a very interesting topic, especially applied to space, because it's for the first time, I think in my life, I feel a lot, I feel that the edges of space law are pushing out further than, than low Earth orbit in a way that it's never happened before. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned the ISS, because uh, that, that brings to mind the Artemis Accords and how it's like, on the one hand, I, I sort of personally felt that NASA has put this forward uh, on the one hand as a way of trying to establish a, a framework for partnerships and cooperation and so forth. But I, I also kind of got the, uh, the idea that this was NASA's way of trying to reemphasize the Outer Space Treaty in light of you know, the Trump administration's executive order saying that, uh, yeah, companies are allowed to uh, extract and exploit resources and so forth. But yes, the big complaint about the Artemis Accords from uh, the Russian side was that, yes, it was too American, too <laughs> American centric there and that they wanted a they wanted a framework that was truly international. And but of course, that uh, that predated to the current political mess. So it's it's difficult to say how that will all shape up there. But yeah, let's uh, let's get to the upcoming conference there in Paris. Uh, this is the uh, International Astronautical Congress. Uh, which will be happening in September, and it's the 73rd annual? Yeah, so, man, I think that's correct. 73rd annual International Astronautical Congress hosted by International Astronautical Federation. And I believe the first Congress itself was, was also in Paris. And we were looking at the history of space law and policy development, in part because it's not necessarily that Things are in tension or things, you know, new things are popping up. There's, there's sort of this cycle that there's, there's nothing new under the sun. In one way or another, all of these questions have been considered at least once. And so, you know, part of our mission at the Space Court Foundation is to sort of revive the record, right? And, and to, to, to look back at what has already been established and discussed and, and worked on. And one of the keys to that early history of space on policy development is through the life of this fascinating figure, Andrew G. Haley, who is, for all intents and purposes, the first space lawyer. Mm -hmm. um, you know, as far back as the 1940s, he was getting involved directly in 
space law and policy and in, in space industrial development as one of the co-founders and I believe the, the second president of Aerojet during World mm-hmm. War II. But, you know, after the end of World War II and we're, we're looking at uh, the international community trying to reestablish international legal system, he was also there working on the establishment of all of these pillars that still exist today in international space law and policy, including the IAF, the organization that is hosting the, the IAC. Um, mm-hmm. And so we thought it was appropriate to uh, submit an abstract, which was accepted um, to the uh, IAA History Symposium track at IAC. Um, and so we're going to be presenting a paper on Andrew G. Haley's influence on all of the major organizations that are part of that very conference. Andrew G. Haley was there in the 1950s with the IAF, the formation of the International Institute of Space Law, the formation of the IAA, the formation of the American organization, which hosted the previous IAC in Washington, D.C., the AIAA. There are lots of I's, lots of A's. Um, Mm -hmm. They're all different organizations, but again, they were all touched and formed or strengthened in the 1950s by the work of of one person who connects all of them. And so Andrew G. Haley himself is is a fascinating figure. And we're also lucky that he put all of his work over that decade and a half into a book called Space Law and Government, published in 1963. And at IAC, we're presenting this paper on Andrew G. Haley and referencing how his book includes a chapter on the formation of all these organizations of that conference. But after that presentation at IAC, the Space Car Foundation is going to be embarking on a 14-month program of media and research uh, on his book, Space Law and Government. So, yeah, looking at a brief bio, one definitely, one definitely gets the impression that he is the, the big daddy of space law. He was like uh, what uh, Kierkegaard was to existentialists this guy was to you guys and another thing uh, another thing that i'm impressed by here is that uh, here is an individual who got in on the ground floor and played a major vital role to something that was uh, just really just burgeoning at the time considering where you guys are in, in the history of the development of space law here right was we're about to embark on yet another uh, burst of activity into space uh, expanding a human presence into space do you ever feel like you're doing exactly what Haley did, sort of getting in on the ground floor and playing a, a vital role? I mean, I can certainly hope that at the end of my career, I will mm-hmm. have achieved even a portion of, of what Haley did. Um, but it's very intimidating uh, to compare oneself against Haley because, you know, even before you get to the 1940s and, you know, the burgeoning space race, uh, leading out of World War II. He was already in the 1930s part of the establishment of a lot of our radio laws and infrastructures. Um, mm-hmm. You know, he was involved with the FCC. And before his professional career, the reason he was involved in radio was because he was a, correct me if I'm wrong, Chris, a transatlantic radio operator. Yeah. You know, so like he. he in between his, also- yeah, in between his, his summer law school years. And so he wasn't just a lawyer. He actually had hands-on experience, right, with radio. And then, you know, again, for space, he had hands-on experience with a rocket company, one of the first mm-hmm. rocket companies. So this also wasn't, this wasn't an example of, you know, lawyers out of touch with the realities of what they were talking about. He had hands-on experience. He was directly involved with a lot of the engineers that people do know by name, like Theodore von Karman, Frank Molina. And so, you know, I mean, that, that itself was impressive. But the, the other thing I want to touch on, and, and just to, it's not correcting you, I just want to properly contextualize this. He didn't do it alone. One of the fascinating things about his book, Space on Government, which again, collects all of his work over time, is how much he goes out of his way to cite other contemporaries and thinkers and academics and jurists. You know, it really is a survey of all of the work that was going on 
uh, from multiple parties at the time of the, you know, these formative years of space on policy. And so the study of Andrew G. Haley and research of his book is also a key to opening up just the entire landscape of figures and thinkers and thoughts going on at that time. Yeah, and, and I'll add that that Haley Haley was was the product of his times and quite a character. And you know, to, to give you a little bit of color, you know, that this man was born in 1904 in Tacoma, Washington, when they had no indoor plumbing. And uh, he, he ends up, as Nathan mentioned, you know, being a well-known communications lawyer, essentially. He was, he was very well-known. He was considered like a genius in the field, so much so that the state of Kentucky gave him the title of the Kentucky Colonel of the Ether in the 1930s. And one of the most interesting and fascinating things for me, especially given the context, is uh, Pearl Harbor happens. A month later, he gets a commission in the Army Air Corps as a major. Seven months later, he's discharged. And you're like, what? What did he do? What happened? He was given a choice by his commanding officer. He says, either you can basically spend the rest of the war at an air base in Greenland, or you can go help Theodore von Karman in Los Angeles get this rocket company going that the, that the U.S. needs for its war effort. And by sheer will, he traveled back and forth between L.A. and D.C. to make sure the government paid the Aerojet so they could get the engineers paid and they would they can move forward on rocket development. So it, it's quite fascinating. And the other thing I think is really important is, as Nathan said, you know, he he's doing a lot. He's 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 building all of the institutions. He's editing all these things. And after Sputnik happens, he goes on basically a North American European tour of the first space law lectures ever with a guy named the Prince of Hanover, uh, who is a, a gentleman named uh, Wilf Heinrich. And he is one of the first recipients of a PhD in aerospace law in Europe. And a lot of the work that is cited is with him, uh, the Prince and Haley. And a lot of that work was compiled by uh, Stephen Doyle, who has been a tremendous help. In fact, is I think one of the last living people on this planet that actually worked with Haley before his, he passed in 1966. And he's actually has compiled for the last 20 years uh, all of his Haley research and has written a draft biography of Haley and his life. It's very complete. It's very forthright, even handed and honest, maybe brutally so in some areas. But it's a, it's a very fascinating read about a very interesting man who's, who's seemed to have been at the right place at the right time, doing the right things. And I always kind of attribute those stories as it's a lot of luck, but, you know, it's good to have friends. So mm -hmm. in, in my case, it's good to have partners like Nathan. And, uh, you know, to answer that question, yeah, I, I, you know, I think from our point of view, this is our, our, our passion legacy project where we want to be able to look back uh, and reflect even on our own educational experiences and see where we think there could be more improvements, there, there could be better opportunities. I mean, for me, I graduated in 2013 from law school as an older student. And, you know, there, there really weren't that many opportunities in space law in particular, uh, or really the commercial space world. But now today, it's just like everywhere you turn, there's a lot of opportunities and it's great to see. But, you know, there's, there's a history there that for some reason, I think in particular with, with lawyers, they don't want to be bothered with history unless it's precedent. And it's really hard, especially within, let's say, space historians to find anyone that has even reviewed a lot of this stuff from a, a historical legal point of view. And you know, a lot of this is, is frozen in stone, but it is such a, an amazing snapshot of early space law and what everyone was really thinking leading up to the Outer Space Treaty's ratification. And all of these guys in, in this book, a Space Law and Government, and all the colloquia that Haley and the Prince uh, uh, put together for the initial ISL colloquias, were all basically converging on the same sort of regulatory topics. And they wanted an international availability or sorry, openness you know, to space. They wanted, yes, they wanted the U.S. to lead, but you know, they wanted a robust sort of world. It's so much so that Haley in his last chapter, Meta Law, is thinking, already thinking about how to rules and legal rules apply to non-humans, right? And, and that, that is 
been divergent into its own set of topics from the SETI point of view to AI, legal personhood, to transhumanism. And, you know, there are still some people burning those candles and looking at what the future holds, whether or not we get there, you know, still remains to be seen. But nonetheless, it's, it's very interesting for us. You know, Haley is just not only was thinking in the same terms we still think today, but he was already thinking ahead. But I would I would say that instead of Kierkegaard, one one it's been relayed to me, and this is I think probably spot on. But Haley kind of takes a Kantian view, right? He thinks that there are certain principles that are, that are inalienable. He's very rule of law based. He wants rules, but he's also pragmatic, and so it's it's sort of a, he's just a fascinating character, and we hope that we we can bring him more to life, uh, and and we also you know are grateful for Stephen Doyle for giving us a really strong perspective on Haley as a person, uh, which is sort of the missing element in this in in the book. I, and I just want to answer a potential follow up question. Yes, Kentucky Colonel of the Ether is the same type of commission given to Colonel Sanders of Kentucky Fried Chicken. Um, <laughs> they were both they were both governor appointed Kentucky colonels just of, uh, of very different subjects. Yeah, different their, their, their legacies are slightly different. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, well, I'm, I'm glad. Uh, well, I'm glad you mentioned that there. That's, uh, I think, a very important historical footnote. And also that, yeah, you, you mentioned how his legal arguments, they actually are related to the SETI and will have applications for the future there. And that's, uh, it's meta law. He coined, he coined the term for that called yeah. Meta law. Yeah. Yeah. Going forward. I can, I can so see how that's going to be uh, far reaching and, uh, and relevant there because yeah, there are concerns that as human beings become increasingly integrated with their technology, there's already a term for it, a uh, transhuman post human. Yeah. Yeah, transhumanism is going to need, uh, there, there's going to have to be a legal framework to protect personhood. And, and then, yeah, very little needs to be said about AI because, yeah, we've been having that debate for God knows how many years. Yeah, in uh, fact, uh, we, we, we really picked up on that, that theme early on with our pilot for the Space Bar show because the premise of that show is the proprietor of the bar is named Hal 9001, and Nathan and I are his patrons. Uh, and ex-space lawyers, and we got him legal personhood and uh, back pay from his former employer. So he took that money and bought a bar, because why not, right? Yeah. Oh, God, yeah. Um, one other thing I, I want to go back to, sort of tying it in with, with Metal on how, how forward-thinking Haley was. His book, the compilation of his work, was published in 1963. And the work that went into that leads directly to the Outer Space Treaty, which was signed in 1967. But one of the sad facts is that Haley did not live to see that culmination of his work. He passed away in 1966. And so for, I think, a lot of people, it's easy to demarcate 1967 as the first year of, you know, written space law. And so Haley, he really predates that. And part of me wonders, had he not passed away, would he be more remembered by being witness and participating in that first establishment, the biggest pillar of, of space law today? So to bring things back to Spaceport Foundation for a bit there, because I also wanted to uh, you know, mention everything it does. So you mentioned uh, your internship program. Obviously, education outreach is a big uh, part of this, informing students about the importance of space law itself. And yeah, you have your moot court competitions. Yeah, let me, um, our, our internship program, you know, is, is geared towards current law students and, and young professionals. But we also are the exclusive organizer for the North American round of the International Institute of Space Law's Manfred Locke's Space Law Moot Court Competition. And for the, the past three years, it's been virtual for obvious reasons, but we are happy to see this year's North American champions from George Washington University, uh, Disclosure, my alma mater. They will be competing in the world finals, also taking place at IAC in Paris this September. 
because that's where the regional winners go to. Uh, they'll be competing against the regional winners from the European region, the Asia Pacific region, um, African region, and Latin American region as well. But once that is over, we will begin. We will begin having North American law students uh, register for the next cycle of the competition. And so you know, it takes place every year. Registration opens in the fall, uh, along with publication of the problem from the International Institute of Space Law. And the work of the competition really happens in the, the spring semester. Each team is asked to prepare arguments uh, for both the applicant and the respondent. And they have to prepare one, written memorials for both sides of the argument. And then mid to late March is when they perform their arguments before panels of judges who we get as volunteers from the industry, actual professional space lawyers and government officials and leading nonprofit think tanks. And so, you know, we're very excited to host hopefully a return to in-person competition this coming March, 2023 in Washington, D.C., eager to, to have more and more North American law schools register. Interest has been growing as the industry has been growing over the past 10 years. And it's, it's an event that I look forward to because it was one of my first involvements as a law student in the broader space law community. Uh, it's a great way to get to know your peers who are also eager and studying space law, but also a great way to meet uh, a term I, I learned a couple of years ago, near peers, uh, those who are just a year or two ahead of you, as as Chris was for me, and then also potential mentors who are already established in the field. And, you know, there's also a great group of alumni like myself and Chris uh, and a number of our colleagues who competed in the competition and now return as volunteers to, to meet the new students and to to offer our, our, our best advice and support as, as they enter their careers as well. So yeah, I, I think the moot core competition is, is a great way for students to get involved with the subject, with the, the community of professionals. And if any students have more questions, they can read about the moot core competition on the Space Corps Foundation's website. They can also see last year's uh, video presentation orientation for the competition, which uh, we will do again this coming year. So for your other resources here, uh, I mentioned Stellar Decisis. That's a, a video series that looks at how courts of the future could handle space law with all kinds of example cases, like nuclear, uh, a nuclear missile is used to destroy an asteroid that threatens Earth, but that creates all kinds of consequences. How do we deal with it? And uh, people laying claim to the moon, which, um, yeah, there's a lot of fear of that right now that, that China is going to try to lay claim and deja vu, huh? Yeah, so Stellar Decisis is our animated pilot. It's fashioned after a moot court competitions, but the way that we present it is each each episode takes on some elements of public international law and space law to tell a story about how you would adjudicate uh, disputes and claims that arise from space activities. And as you rightly mentioned in our, our pilot episode is on planetary defense, and it involves an asteroid that will hit the Earth. And if mitigation measures are taken, and we present these basic facts very concisely uh, through a newscast, which then goes right into the courtroom, and we bring two actual space lawyers who represent both sides of the case, and argue before a panel of three judges who are subject matter experts in the topic of the of the episode. The bulk of the episode, really, after we get through the arguments uh, by the two attorneys, is to watch the judges have a conversation to resolve the case. They have contentions they have to discuss, and they have to eventually, at the end of the episode, vote on how to administer those contentions to which parties, what kind of remedies do they get. So we try to give a, a sense of how a court would operate, um, but we're going to present different types of courts, different types of problems. In fact, the two next uh, episodes that we've drafted are Crime on the Moon and the Assertion of State Sovereignty on Mars. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have uh, Nathan and I have been working on this. We have about four interns that are working on this. 
And we go through a whole vetting process with many of our colleagues. So we try to make it accessible without overly technical, but being able to follow a basic story and, you know, doing it in an animated style gives us the the flexibility. But, you know, the other interesting thing about us putting Stellar Decisis together is, you know, we discovered so many talented people within the space law and space policy and just the space community writ large. And many of them um, have stepped forward to donate their time and help us with sell decisis from Charlie Harris to, to Ben Corbin. Ben also did a lot of additional uh, music for us for the Space Bar show. I was going to mention that next. Yeah. Yeah. And so we're, we're, we're working on uh, Nathan and I, and, and I think we have about four other interns and we have a couple other external colleagues who are helping us draft five additional episodes we're not entirely settled yet on uh, the topics and the themes of each episode, but we have like a billion great ideas and we hope to uh, be able to have those recorded by the end of the year. But right now we are focusing on Stellar Decisis and our goal is to at least have uh, a sample of the new episodes ready, at least for audio, uh, if not animated, by IAC. So that's that's kind of other than the Haley project, what we've been focusing on, and we've uh, we've given interns different opportunities across these uh, these different projects, and so we're we're really able to give, especially the younger our younger interns, a lot of interesting opportunities that they can't really get anywhere else. And it is a global internship; it's a virtual internship. But anyone can apply, and we've recently actually signed an MOU with UNIDWA, which uh, was formed during the League of Nations, around the League of Nations. And they are an intergovernmental private international law organization. And one of the things they're known for in space law is the development of the Cape Town Convention Space Assets Protocol. And they are a set of arbitration rules for secure transactions and how you deal with arbitrating space assets, so to speak. It's it's a part of a trend that has happened uh, with other organizations, including, oddly enough, there is a space court of arbitration in Dubai that recently formed after we formed. So we were, you know, we were ahead of the game and, and, and very forward thinking, just like Haley, just didn't think it would be only a couple of years before we'd actually have something called the space court. You know, we really want to leverage all these different types of content to tell the story, the basic research question, what is space law? So if anyone asks, you know, there is a relative answer that people can point to examples somewhere. Because even today, and I've been doing this for a very long time, won't say how long, but a very long time, I still get, what the hell is space law? Is that aliens or something? And mm-hmm. it's and, it, and as you started out this podcast basically acknowledging, right, is is we're going to need these rules in space. And Haley believed that too. In fact, um, Ford of the Space Law Government, there's a nice quote from Von Karman giving a toast to Haley at the first, I think, shareholders or board dinner of Aerojet. And, you know, he's saying, we are the engineers, we can get us to space, but we need the lawyers to tell us what rules do we need to live by so that we all live in peace. And so I think that's that's a nice sentiment. So in terms of uh, this upcoming, the upcoming IAC 2022, are there any other highlights that, that are expected from this year's meeting? I would just encourage everybody to follow us online for any surprises we may have during this year's IAC. And that's, yeah, they can follow you online. Just simply type in Space Corp Foundation or SCF. And there's sure to be a lot of very, very interesting nuggets. Also, there are multiple interview series uh, that are really worth checking out. First of which, this was launched in 2021. The Women of Color in Space, which is, uh, yes, very, very lovely. They're launched in February 2021 and features women of color from all over the world who are playing an active role in the new era of space exploration and commercial space. Okay. Absolutely. Bye, everybody. (laughs) Bye-bye. Okay. Yeah. So, Chris, uh, let me... Let me, yeah, can, I intro, can I intro that again? Yeah. Uh, also, yeah, yeah. Uh, Space Corp Foundation also has their interview series, which uh, currently the series that uh, was launched back in February of 2021 is Women of Color in Space, which interviews luminaries from the space industry, from 
space law and, uh, and education and outreach about humanity's future in space, featuring the game-changing women who are involved and who come from really all over the world, who are breaking multiple barriers. And that too is definitely worth checking out. Yeah, our interview series is something that was the, the brainchild of Nivi Raju, one of our officers, and uh, Letitia Zarkhan, who's another one of our officers. And they were able to put this series together rel- relatively quickly. And, and it was really exciting to see them you know, and, and who they decided to, to interview because there's so many wonderful people in the industry. And it's interesting that they, that they chose uh, these, I believe, nine. And we're still working, I think, on one last one, trying to finish that off. So there still is one more, hopefully, that we'll have. But we wanted to, to highlight the different ways that you can come into the space community, what different people in the space community are doing. And I think it really speaks to us trying to provide resources uh, and opportunities for everybody, uh, and including those you know who, women of color who may not be fully represented in the space exploration community, so to speak. But certainly, I would say even in, in space law, underrepresented. And I, I, I think the other interesting thing about for us is I would say many of our interns fit this description, and it's really great for us to be able to give people a sense of even if you don't want to do law. How can you contribute? And a lot of our our younger interns, some of which are thinking about studying law or are studying law, we wanted to be, in terms of servicing the space law industry, we and the interns and, and young professionals, we understand that. But we also understood that there are a lot of people who don't know space law, maybe hearing it for the first time because they came to our website. And we wanted to be accommodating. So we didn't want to bias because in a lot of cases, if you if you have pre-established expertise, there are pathways that there's a circuit for that, right? Like, but for us, we wanted to be able to provide opportunities to, to anyone who was interested in space law. Nivi and Letitia have done such a great job and have worked with Mac Lee and, and Yana, our other in, our other officers, and Nathan to make sure that that these episodes reflected the, the reality that, that we live in and reflect uh, what opportunities exist. And we really wanted people to uh, understand us as not just an American organization, but as an international organization and everyone that's welcome. Well, that's great. Yeah. So once again, I encourage everyone to check out uh, Space Court Foundation and its activities and... Oh. To stay tuned for upcoming events from the upcoming IAC, which promises to be a very interesting time. And yeah, I wish you guys the best of luck. I will say, I think that when you follow in the footsteps of the masters or seek uh, what they sought, you're likely to find yourself occupying a very similar role in the future, right? Oh, yes. Yeah, so you're standing on, on the shoulders, yes, of giants. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Newton. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's like all all humility and modesty notwithstanding, That's you can find yourself in that position. And it's like at that point, you realize all the greats you looked up to, well, they, they were just like you. They set out to do something good they owed a debt to those who came before them and they would provide a similarly a, a foundation or shoulders for future people i i hope that the that proves to be true for you guys that's something that we strive for and uh we really appreciate the opportunity and being on, on your podcast and talking about the space court foundation and our youtube projects uh and you know we look forward to talking to you more and uh, obviously, if you need to uh, need any more space lawyers, let us know. We, we, we know how to find them. Hey, no problem. Thank you, Joan, for coming out. All right. Thanks, man. Goodbye. Thank you so much for having us. This has been Stories from Space. I'm your host, Matt Williams. Good day. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Stories from Space podcast with Matthew Williams. If you learned something new and this podcast made you think, then share ITSPMagazine.com with your friends, family, and colleagues. If you represent a company and wish to associate your brand with our conversations, sponsor one or more of our podcast channels. We hope you will come back for more stories and follow us on our journey. You can always find us at the intersection of technology, cybersecurity, and society.